Okay, uh, I think you can hear me. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, us today on the presentation. Uh, this is a follow-up presentation on uh, as part of the marketplace. There was already a very interesting one yesterday for some of you I can recognize who attended uh, with Jihad and Giuseppe on the International uh, Humanitarian City Humanitarian Data Bank. Um, we'll, we'll do a few references to that uh, today as well. Um, my name is Florent Chanet. I'm the project manager for the Egypt project, which we're going to give you a few details into uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, and before starting, I also would like to thank the Lock Cluster for the opportunity to present the project, but also for the coherence uh, resonating a bit with what Giuseppe said yesterday, for the coherence of the presentation that was selected for that. Uh, we having indeed discussion with uh, uh, the IHC and the IMPACT project, because there's obviously a lot of elements that uh, cross-check with each other, <clears throat> and uh, there's a certain coherence in having those representation over the next uh, three days. So, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'll come back to that as we discuss, but obviously the two initiatives of the IHC doing a regional mapping uh, through the custom system and the Stockholm platform of ESAP doing a national mapping through a different system uh, is obviously very complementary. If you put yourself in the position of a national authority trying to make decisions for the preparedness of prepositioning in country, being able to see what they have, what they lack, and where they can get what they lack makes a lot of sense in terms of having a complete picture. So um, following up on the presentation of the regional uh, mapping done by the IHC, by Giuseppe yesterday uh, and Jihad, <coughs> I'm going to present you the Stockholm platform mostly, uh, but before that I'll give you a bit of background about where this platform falls into and what is the ESOT project. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> so I just want to mention that the presentation you're about to see is actually online and accessible on the website, on the ESOT website. My colleague Sophia will put a few links in the chat as we go. Uh, and so you can refer back to that at any point if you want to access it or if you want to show it to someone else, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, so I'll present you the Stockholm platform, but give you a bit of introduction on ESUPS before. <coughs> Sorry, let me start that. Here we go. Uh, yes, bit of background, Stockholm, what is it and why we're putting it together? How does it work? And then I'll show you the main three part of the platform. We won't go too much into the detail of the how does it function in the background, but to give you what it can can do. And then I'll uh, say a few words about how we plan to connect it and the things we've already started to do that and what are the next steps, what's come forward. So in order to start with a bit of background, ESUPS is a project that started around five years ago. Uh, we currently have three staffs on board. I'm one of them. Sophia Online is our communication and advocacy. Um, a specialist and we have a data analyst on board uh, also working on the modelization etc. Um, the project is uh, funded by USID, it has been from the now BHA from the beginning um, and it's channeled through Weltunger Hilfe, so we are contracted Weltunger Hilfe um, but the project is not really a Weltunger Hilfe project in the sense that's all decision making uh, and the direction of the project I made by, are made by a steering group composed of the organization you can see um, on the left of your screen. Oh, I see there's someone in the chat. Yes. Um, who are our target or our audience? Uh, first of all, the national authorities. Um, as I mentioned, the, the whole idea of the project is to be able to give national decision makers uh, inform um, documentation about the prepositioning situation. And they remain ultimately in charge of disaster response and preparedness. And therefore, even if supported by NGOs and INGOs like yourself, uh, they remain ultimately the, the audience for that project. Um, obviously, we're trying to engage with regional coordination bodies who also have an interest into those kind of questions and that come back to the initial point about the international humanitarian city and the work they've been doing with the humanitarian data bank. Uh, but we're also trying, trying to engage with um, 
regional bodies like Sepredenac in Latin America or the Ha Center in uh, in Asia. Although our many attempts have not been very fruitful on the Ha Center so far, so we're going to keep pushing on that. Uh, you'll see there's academia in there. Uh, they're basically the underlying foundation for the model that we use in the platform. I will show you in a minute. Um, the log cluster preparedness, of course, or we wouldn't be there today. But on a more practical level, we also do a lot of work. Um, when we engage into a country, we need to have a coordination uh, for logistics, a coordination structure for logistics. So it can be the log cluster or it can be a national logistic group, working group, whatever it's called. But most of the places we've engaged so far has been through um, places where the log cluster preparedness was in place. So Madagascar was one, Nepal was one, <coughs> Honduras at the moment is one, etc. Uh, I've also made a mention of OCHA, and that also linked back to the initial point of that presentation about the fact that those projects are linked. And the OCHA, through the IMPACT project, are working on identifying uh, some really fight and HS codes. Uh, and we have an interest to look into that to see how those can be connected with our own item groups, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is just a bit of a rough idea about uh, who are the main targets and, and partners of that project. Before we go too far, uh, I will show you a quick um, video because it will give you the, the whole background and then we can go straight into the platform. So that's a two and a half minute video. Uh, and then I'll come back to you once this is done. Uh, or not. Here we go. Hmm. Sorry for that. Seems like we have a bit of a bug there. Just sorry for the for the bug. Give me a sec. <coughs> Okay, that is not working. Apologies for that uh, issue. Uh, Florent, if you want, I can share the YouTube link to the video if you want to quickly open it from there. Maybe it works better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will put it in the chat of this uh, Zoom meeting, okay? Yeah. So it's all th also there for everyone else. Just a moment. Yeah. Sorry for that little bug there. I'm not really sure what happened. You put it out. Here we go. Okay. You can still see my screen, yeah? No, we can't, Florent. Ah, you can't. Share screen. Pre-positioning relief items is a preparedness mechanism embraced by most international and national humanitarian agencies. It allows to provide immediate assistance to affected people in an area, even if damaged accesses prevent help coming from outside. The problem is there is no strategy to coordinate decisions across agencies about what to pre-position, where, and in which quantities. This leads to gaps, duplications, and cost and time inefficiencies in the prepositioning of critical items. So much so that the very purposes of prepositioning are severely impaired. With ESUPS, we want to tackle this problem by moving beyond coordination into active collaboration. ESUPS develops tools that allow all national and local stockholders to come together and define a collective pre-positioning strategy. This framework allows each agency to then define its own plan, considering what others have, to reach optimum efficiency. When national authorities and responders know what the overall stock capacities in country are, they are in a better position to get what they lack. This is how ESAP supports logistics localization through a rebalancing of the push-pull approach 
giving local decision makers a stronger voice in what comes in their country. And this is how ESOFs works. Stock data is collected and displayed in the Stock of Humanitarian Organizations Logistics Mapping Platform, or Stockholm. Registered users can update data online autonomously as often as needed and filter data based on several parameters. Stockholm is free and connected to other platforms used in the sector. ESOPS runs two types of data analyses. First, an analysis on the last 40 years of disasters in each country to understand their impact on locations and affected people. And second, an analysis comparing the existing stock to the needed stock, should those past disasters happen again today. These analyses allow ESOPs to provide collective recommendations to all agencies pre-positioning in countries. These suggestions can help to move towards a more efficient way to pre-position relief items, saving both time and money. ESUPS also promotes a global change of mindset towards more collaborative preparedness activities. We work closely with academia to research underexplored practices, such as the possibility to pool resources through loan and borrowing stock, allowing for a smoother exchange of relief items. Visit our website for more information. And please share this video to help us promote ESUPS collective approach to pre-positioning. Thank you for that. No, we're not going to watch this process <laughs> concept. Um, okay, so let's try to resume back to the video then to the presentation. <clears throat> it might be working now. Okay. So that was the video. Okay, so uh, not coming back to the what and why, I mean, you understand the fact there's no coordination and coherence in what is preposition where. So we're trying to help that process. Uh, a couple of words about what Stockholm is, but also what is not. Um, so we provide a visual overview of stock uh, as long as partners uh, inform the platform. And that's where we have a difference with the system of the Humanitarian Data Bank. They can use custom information because the items are coming in staying there where they are and coming out again. But in the case of the national stock, the items are coming in, but they're never coming out. So we can't actually do a, we can't use the same system. And so we have to rely on the fact that partners update their data because they, they see the interest for themselves. Uh, so it provides a visual overview of stock. It provides a stock analysis, and I will come back on the collective nature of those. Um, it is owned by users, so in the sense that once we have, um, and I will use this example all along the presentation, but if we have the global logistic coordinator for Save the Children uh, registering, then Save the Children as an organization has an access, and anything that happens after that will be pushed down from one level down to the next. So we're really trying to hand the tool over to the users. And the platform is meant to be connected with others. Uh, I think. Um, Giuseppe uh, referred to that yesterday as one of the questions about what happened to the data and can they be shared. The, the data are not ours, uh, they, they belong to the users and we are the custodian of it. So we have a responsibility in, to, in, in terms of not breaching confidentiality and putting you know, um, security risk onto the information. Uh, but there's ways to share the data in an aggregated and anonymous, anonymous way. So that's the kind of things we're looking at, so that the information can be used as other layers for other analysis without displaying any uh, security information. So we plan to have those connections made uh, up front uh, and down, down size the platform, and I'll show you a bit more at the end. Uh, it is not a warehouse management system. It's not built for that, so you won't have a record of what's coming in, what's going out. You can't use that to your inventory. It's not going to track your distribution, any of that. It is not built for that. It is really just a, a mapping at one T, T point in time. Um, 
And there's no other information than stock in there. We had a bit of a debate to know if we would put the road network, the presence of port, airport, etc. And we decided not to for two reasons. First, it's going to keep the platform lighter with less data to, to report on. And the other thing is that there's many other partners who are doing that far better than we will, including the log AI platform from the logistic cluster with whom we're trying to engage. So if we both have the same set of information, we take the risk of running under synchronization issues rather than relying on the fact that they do what they do well and we do what we do well. So the only thing you'll find in Stockholm are information related to stocks and that's it. Uh, again, a couple of words on that. Uh, most of that has been mentioned in the video, uh, but just two things. The growing of humanitarian funding gap, you're all aware of this. Uh, there's more and more disasters, they're more and more violent, they require more and more resources, and the fund funding capacity, uh, if growing, which is not a guarantee, is certainly not going to grow at the same speed as the need. So this gap is only going to increase. And if we keep doing what we've been doing for 40 years in terms of prepositioning, we never gonna, it's not never going to work. The needs are going to be far too big for what we are actually doing. So our perception on the, on the issue of prepositioning is that we need to change the way we've been doing it. Um, there's also an emerging trend of initiative going into the pooling resources. Uh, the last DJ Co policy on logistics is really highlighting that. Uh, they're also supporting initiatives like the Réseau Logistique Humanitaire, who's working really on two pooling resources across organizations. And it's not only about stock, it's also about personal, about vehicle, about fleet, about trainings, about a lot of things. So the pooling resources idea is getting um, a bit more in force. And that's where we're trying to inscribe the ESOPS project into this idea that we need to more work a bit more collectively as it was mentioned in the video. Two words I want to emphasize, uh, preparedness. We see many partners uh, quite excited with the platform because now they have a visual about what is where, which was not there before, uh, with an idea that is going to be very useful during response time. It is only partially true. If you have a disaster with a lead that gives you a bit of lead time, like a cyclone, where you have a bit of a forecast where it's going to land and where it's going to be affected, you can use the platform to quickly redispatch from your stock in anticipation. However, for most of the disaster, you don't have this kind of uh, lead time uh, and the platform is not really done for that. The sense where you have information about what you have, but if you're struck by an earthquake in a place, organization present will open the doors of their preposition stock, which is made exactly for that, distribute what they have, and the information in the platform will be off until the replenishment is done. So it can be used for, for response capacity, but very much it is a preparedness tool to get people to sit around the table when there's no disaster and to make sure the prepositioning is done the best possible way in anticipation of those response time. The other word is collective. Um, as we know, we've all been doing prepositioning for ever. Uh, we've all been doing prepositioning in the silo of our own organization. So Red Cross doesn't know what UNICEF has, UNICEF doesn't know what WFP have, and WFP has no idea what the government has, who generally has no idea about what whoever has. And when we come back to this initial idea that they're ultimately the one in charge and responsible for disaster response, if anyone should have those information, it should be the government. So the fact that everybody has been doing it in their own uh, silo leads to gaps, duplication, lack of coherence. And so the model we're trying to develop is of a collective nature. So the model will not provide recommendation per agency because that's exactly the model we're trying to step away from. Okay, so I will show you the main uh, section of the platform uh, through the live platform that will be easier. Just let me refresh those two pages while we speak. So that's the landing page of the platform. You will see a lot of similarities with what we saw yesterday presented by Jihad on the Umatan data bank in terms of filtering and visuals. But basically, uh, you have three main sections. The first one is the personal information. The second one is reports and analytics. And the third, third one is managed data. We will not go into the managed data because it's very much about the how to you make the function, the platform function. But I wanted to show you uh, the main three the main, let's say, four sections. The first one is a personal dashboard, and the personal dashboard will be tailored to your role. Uh, the roles are multiple. You have a few super admins, which are 
ourselves, Sophia, the developers, etc., to be able to monitor the platform and, and, and fix any problem. But most of the role will be administrator of a geographical area. If you are being given the role of administrator for Save the Children for Asia Pacific, then you will be able to do anything within Save the Children, Save the Children within uh, the Asia Pacific, including giving access to someone who is only in charge of the Pacific. Then this person will only be able to do something for Save the Children in the Pacific. And then your personal dashboard will be tailored to that role. So I'm going to show you the one which was mine, how it looks like, which is a bit irrelevant because my role is more to manage the fact that the platform is going well rather than managing my stock. Um, but I'll show you how it looks like. <coughs> In a second. So the, plan, the dashboard will be, so it's composed of four dash parts, and you'll see you have two tabs at the bottom. So one is about your user detail and one is about your stock detail. You can see here the number of pending of registration. There's nothing here because I'm up to date, but when I have a registration received and I need to process it, I have them here and I can see how many there are and I can click on the detail to see where they are and I can go into my manage user page to actually process them, give them access, etc. I have one dash part which tells me how many of the stocks have been updated since when. So it gives you an idea about how accurate the data are. So you will see that we have eight of them that have not updated uh, their data in more than three months. It doesn't mean the stock is not up to date because maybe they didn't receive or dispatch anything, but it just gives you an indication. And then two months and then one month, you have a capacity to look at your usage the number in terms of um, users and for myself in terms of agencies, but that will not be available for all of them. Now, what's more interesting as the agency level is to the dashboard to manage your stock. So again, mine, mine doesn't really mean anything because I have all the stock from everybody so far. So it's just um, lots of items and things. But what you will see if you are the Save the Children Asia Pacific coordinator, for my previous example, you will see how many items you have in terms of number of items, not in, not, not in terms of quantity. So if you have tarpaulins and blankets, that's two items, even if you have 5,000 of each. Um, the items that you need to validate, I'm not going to go far in the detail, but basically you will have an opportunity to choose if you want your facility manager to update the stock for the stock to be live directly, or if you want to instigate an extra step where you validate the entries of your facility manager, should it be someone relatively new or that needs to come on board, etc. And then as long as the information have been informed into the platform, you, the platform will also give you a dashboard about how many items you are about to get expired in a delay of one month, three months, six months, uh, and how many items are about to reach the minimum stock level, again, if this has been informed uh, and decided in the platform. And then all this is uh, dynamic, so you can select a cluster name, so you can say, for instance, you want only the CZ item for shelter, so you will click on that and that will automatically update the table and then you will have uh, you can click on any item to see the detail and then under that you have a table that you can make widescreen and you have all the details about uh, the organization and where they have been modified and who is the owner and the quantities etc not going to go too far into the detail i mean so it's really the kind of screen you can play with once you have your access that will be personalized to, to your role but it basically gives you an overview of where you are with your stock and where you need to take action uh, should there be things that, that are required okay so now i'm going to move into this section called reports and analytics and you'll see there's three main parts stock mapping which is the one i'm going to show you now and then the last two which are on those pages which i'm also show you in a minute so the stock mapping is actually the landing page and that's probably the the most uh, useful practical one to use at the moment uh, so it's relatively simple you have a selection of filter on your left uh, you can select countries, so let's say we select Madagascar and Honduras and uh, I don't know, uh, here you go, and let's, oh, sorry, I've deleted that, Honduras, oh, it's already there, 
let's say I put back Madagascar and Vanuatu, for instance. And then when you select that, you will see on the platform, uh, the stock you've selected will appear on the map. So you will see here the stock in Honduras and in Madagascar and in Vanuatu. Whatever you select on those filters will appear on the map. Whatever you see on the map will be displayed in a, in a overall stock report. The stock report reacts to what you see on the map. So if I zoom on the map and de facto exclude Honduras and Vanuatu from what I see, the system will automatically update in the stock report here to only show the stock of Madagascar. Okay. You can uh, add extra information. Uh, so if I clear all filter uh, and select all countries, you will see all the stock we have at the moment. <coughs> here you go. So that's the stock we've mapped so far. Uh, and then you will see that at the bottom of this filter here, it's very slow today for whatever reason. Here at the bottom, you have another lot of filters. So you can say, okay, I want to see all the items, but only for, again, shelter. And in the shelter, I don't want to see all of them, but I just want to see, uh, let's say, blankets and tarpaulins. So you can select your blankets and you can select your tarpaulins and the system will automatically update to reflect uh, the selection you've made. Okay, so you will see that it's updating and here you have the data. Okay, so you will see you have a couple of lines because someone has used a piece as unit and someone has used each. That's the kind of little things we need to fix, but basically you have all the information. Now the information you have, you can decide to have extra details, so you can include extra column. So if you want to have this, but you want to see the split by, let's say by country, you can add this column country and it will take each of your items there and split them by the countries you have. So you can see the detail where they are, etc. Okay. You can see your tarpaulins here, etc. You can also or select the detail per agency. So if you want to only see your, let's say, tarp, your blanket, you will take your tarpaulins off in this filter that will update the stock. And here you will have the tarpaulins and you will see how they are uh, dispatched or separated between countries and agency. Here you go. In the EAU, in PNG, in Madagascar, with Fiji Red Cross, etc. So you have all the details here. Uh, all the data you have selected there that you have on the map, you can download them uh, that will come out of the CSV file and then they will be organized by column and then you can filter it and play with the data the way you want. Uh, you also have another uh, function that I want to quickly show you. It's called the polygon. So imagine that you live in a place which is frequently impacted by disaster, like cyclone, like in the Pacific, and you know the cyclone will come a certain way, you can say, okay, the cyclone will come and hit that area over Solomon Island and Vanuatu. And then you select your area and then the, the system will tell you what is the stock you have in this area so that you can start contacting the organization, see if you need to redispatch stock, et cetera, et cetera. Again, not going too far into the detail of that, but I think you get the sense. Obviously, because we have we can't use the same system that uh, the Humanitarian Data Bank is using to use the custom information, this relies entirely on the fact that the user updates their data because they see a value on them, them with themselves of coordinating how they do preposition. We have a growing number of users. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 76 organizations and 35 um, countries. And I think we are closing to 120 users. Um, so it's growing. And the more we have data, the more accurate are the mapping and therefore the more accurate is the analysis I'm about to show you. Uh, so the second tab I want to show you is called the National Disaster Analysis. And I'm gonna show it to you because it's preloaded. So what we do here, the, the way the, the all analysis function is relatively simple and basic. We look at the existing stock. For that, we use the stock mapping. Then we look at how the con one country was affected by disaster over the last 40 years, or even a bit more now, because it's 1981, uh, 40 years. And that is basically what we have here. 
So we can select a country. So these are all the countries we've analyzed so far. We haven't gone through the whole list, but we we adding on regularly. So if you say you select a country like uh, PNG, Papua New Guinea, you will see the detail of disaster in that country over the last 40 years, uh, classified by type. So you can see the floods, etc. Here you can see the overall of the country, but you can decide to drill down. And if you drill down here, you will have the level per province across the country. So that will give you an idea about uh, how many disaster hit each uh, provinces, uh, the number of affected people, and the yellow dot is actual number of disasters. Now you can also, because this whole map is uh, dynamic, you can say, okay, I want to specifically look at the earthquake. And so the platform will automatically update and you will see you know, that, you know, you had two earthquakes in East New Britain over the last 40 years with not many people affected. You can also do the same on the map. Uh, you can drill down on the map and then you will see the detail of disaster, where they are, the scale of it, in that case, earthquake, but you can decide to go for the floods instead, and then the map will update the number of affected people, etc. Uh, you can also go the other way around and you can say, I want to see the situation of disaster for the last 40 years in the Morbe province. So you can select the province and then that will automatically update the scale on the pie chart, the number of affected people, etc. etc. Again, I'm not going to go too far. Uh, one thing you can, you should know also is that you can select multiple countries. You don't have to stick to one, uh, but all that is dynamic. Those data are not our data. They come from a public uh, website called MDAT, Emergency Database, uh, and they collect their data from uh, OCHA, UN agencies, insurance company, INGOs, Relief Web, all sorts of reports. So they aggregate all that, uh, government, of course, and, and these are the information they collect. Their database is very useful, but when we download the data, it's a bit messy, a bit complicated to read. So we have to do a lot of automatic and manual cleaning, but those data are available to be picked up. Uh, you can select any of them and download it. And each analysis is also available in an Excel clean format on the website under the country section. So um, Sophia will share a link, but those data are not ours. We just needed them, so we've cleaned them but they can be used for a lot of other things. We've recently shared that with our partners who wanted to do some analysis on cash programming, which has not much to do with prepositioning directly. And that was the information useful for them. So uh, we, we we simply done a bit of cleaning exercise because we needed it, but we, we're happy to share that with whoever needed it because that, that's not ours. Uh, so basically what you know you have here with the stock mapping, now you know what stock is where and in which location, etc. It's just a mapping. And now we know what type of disaster the stock is support, supposed to respond to. And that leads us to actually the third table, which I wanted to show you. So in the menu, it's called uh, here, uh, National Stock Analysis. So now that we have those two information, we can layer them out and we can see how the stock present would respond to those disasters if they were to happen again and taking them all over 40 years as a as an average. So this is the exercise we've done for Madagascar. What you can see here, you have two tabs as well. One is the national level overview, and the second one is the analysis per item. The national le level overview, again, is by nature collective. So you want this detail per agency here. But what it tells you is that in Madagascar, the stock combine of all organizations prepositioning stock for response, uh, and that include basically everyone in Madagascar. We had a very strong uh, partner partnership, including the Ministry of Education and Water, etc. That all the stock combined in Madagascar currently present can support around 39% of the disasters that affect the country, which is an average disaster size of 14,000 people, which is not much. That would be a fluctuating depending if you are in the capital where there's more stock. And so this uh, ratio would increase a bit, or if you're in provinces where there's less stock and this ratio would decrease a bit. But across the country, with all the stock present, the country has the capacity to support roughly to 40% of the disaster affecting them. This is not an, uh, this figure will become important when we go to the next tab, which I'll show you in a minute. Now, on of that, you can also do two type of a uh, bit more drill down assessments. One is per uh, quantity. So this is an overview of all your items combined, but you can break that down. So if you look at your kitchen sets collectively, 
you will see that your capacity is 49%. Okay, we have a little bug because this number of people here didn't change. We are fixing that at the moment. Uh, so your collective kitchen set can support around 49% of disasters. But you can see that while you need to potentially get more, the one you have are pretty well located. Okay, so we, we've done this analysis with cost, distances, transport, etc. I'm not getting into the technical detail background, but basically the kitchen set where they're located as the amount they're pretty much right into the in the right spots. Okay, and you can see that across the other item, they're, they're, they're quite good. We've done analysis in Nepal, which was very different. When we look at Madagascar, it's pretty good. Now the last uh, item you, the last graph you have is trying to give you a sense of priority when you look at the issue collectively. You are sitting around a table with the shelter cluster and you're part of it and you want to know where should we start if we want to make the biggest impact quickly uh, in terms of saving cost and saving money. Well, the system will look at this old data and will tell you that roughly these are the three provinces where you should start. So for any item you're going to bring into any of those provinces, this is where you're going to quickly start improving your time and efficiency uh, and cost response. So what gives you this table is an overall sense of where you stand collectively, an overall stand uh, about where you are a bit more down at the quantity and location level, and a bit of a sense about where are the priorities should you start somewhere. Now you can then drill that down to the next uh, last piece I want to show you which is uh, the analysis per item. <coughs> if it wants to load, yes, it's coming. So what you can do here, uh, and remember the 39% we looked at before. Now, again, imagine you are sitting in a country, you have a shelter cluster, and you want to look at your situation of kitchen sets, and you want to look at it specifically into a province. So we're going to look for a province, let's say this one. And now you can say, we want to define a common objective, which is what we didn't have before, because we are all doing things randomly in our own corner. So let's have a common objective to say, let's say we want to support 75% of disaster with kitchen sets affecting this province. You will see three things coming up. The first one is your ideal stock level. And again, we have a bit of a glitch on the display, but fixing that. Uh, the ideal stock level is 690 looking at what happened for 40 years in this part of the country. You currently collectively have 150, you're missing 540. Now your 540 you're missing, you can buy them on the local market, you can buy them on the international market, or you can contact regional partners like the International Humanitarian City uh, and the Humanitarian Data Bank we discussed yesterday to say how they could come to your help and complement the missing parts. But you have another option, which is, do you have overstock capacities across the country in other places, which is the whole point of this tool. And the answer is yes. So if you look at this place in Morondava province, the model tells us, uh, and we're working on some issues there, but the model tells us they should have 110. They have, two, uh, they have almost 2,200. And the reason there are so many is because everybody's pre 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 prepositioning kitchen set without discussing with each other. So now there's far too many in Morondava. And so by removing 540 of this, you would come to a closer point about what the ideal is on this warehouse because you would remove the understock or part of it and you would bring it in that part where you would reach a more higher efficiency in terms of being better prepared for cost and time response in Mahanjaga for kitchen sets. What the model will not tell you, and that brings me back to the issue of having a, a, a platform which is of a collective nature, that when you're going to decide, if you decide collectively to move those 540 missing kitchen set from Morandava to here, the system is not going to tell you if it should be the Red Cross or UNICEF or the government. That's a decision that you have to make internally in country because the stock is yours. We have no legitimacy to say, oh, that should be this or, or this that should do the moving. It's a decision that will have to be made in country. But at least the system will give you an indication that you have far too many in this place, that you have far not enough in this one, and there's probably something to do in between. The last information you will see in there is if the recommendation provided where to be implemented, the potential time and cost savings are 8% in time, which is around one day per week in terms of response time, and around 30% in cost, which I think we'll agree start become uh, significant. 
Uh, the other thing we are working on, we had uh, we, we had in on before and we need to fix a few things, but this two parts here work in progress will give you a bit more detail about how much time and cost you can save for each item you can move. So it will give you a, a value uh, idea, both in terms of time and cost about what, the, what, what, what type of saving are we talking about? Are we saving like saving an hour because I'm going to move 500 blankets or saving three days of response? So that's the kind of information uh, those last two dash parts will show you uh, in the next few weeks. So that's it. I'm not going to find more into that. In the managed data, the only thing I can tell you is that you see all those parts about actually managing the data. The first four one, cluster organization, item groups and agency are only accessible by super admin. So when you have an access which also going to be personalized, most likely what you will be able to do will be to manage your item, to manage your facility, to manage your users and to manage your geographical areas. I'll stop it here. Uh, I'll take some questions. I just want to uh, finish the presentation to give you the last bit about where we go from here. Uh, I'm going to skip that quickly, not quickly. Here you go, stock analysis, that's all done. Okay, so uh, quickly talking about the connection. We plan uh, upstream and downstream connection with the platform. So first, things that should feed into the platform. We're very aware that organi some organizations have warehouse management systems in place. And so having to update SOCOM would be a double handling. Uh, so while we don't have a system for that yet, but we're starting to look at creating APIs, which are connection between existing WMS uh, from some organization with the Stockholm platform. So that when they update their warehouse management system, it automatically updates the platform and they don't have to do a double entry. So that's one more thing we're working on. We're going to look at automating uh, the geographical information we get in terms of uh, shape files, etc., and also the historical data we get from MDAT. At the moment, it's a download, Excel spread, uh, spreadsheet, cleaning, etc. We're going to do how we can uh, potentially accommodate that. And the idea also, as I said initially, the platform is meant to be connected. So we're looking at how we're going to share those information without breaking confidentiality or putting security people in security uh, risk. So one of the partners we're looking at sharing information is, would be the log IE uh, cluster because they have so many other layers in, of information that having the stock data would also be a very interesting information to be able to put as part of different analysis. The way we plan to do that, and we've just initiated discussion, is to aggregate, aggregate and anonymize the data. So, for instance, we're not going to say, um, I don't know, the Malagasy Red Cross has 5,000 blankets in this very precise location in Madagascar, which could would potentially be a security risk. Uh, what we plan to do is to say the human community as a whole, from the information we collected, has 23,000 blankets in this province. So there will be no name, there will be no location, but it becomes an information, even if it's a bit less granular, but it's an information that can be taken to start doing some other type of analysis. We're having discussion with regional disaster management systems. So I was referring to the separate ENAC before. They have developed a similar system as LogAI for their internal use for the region. And similarly, we could look at linking Stockholm with them for the same purpose, uh, and also some existing, more and more existing DM system at national level. And we may be <laughs> considering other initiatives like the Réseau Logistique Humanitaire, with whom we've engaged discussion as well, uh, although this is a bit less defined about where the connection would happen. Anyway, the platform is meant to be uh, used as a link as well uh, between different parties. In terms of way forward, uh, my colleague Sophia Online has started to do a lot of work on developing the training and the how-to. We've created a YouTube channel uh, on which we're going to start posting them when they're ready about how to create an item, how to create a facility, how to uh, register a user, how to invite somebody, all that. Um, we are in the process of delivering, uh, delivering for the moment ad hoc training of trainers, but we're going to formalize this a little bit more in the next few months. Uh, we've put in place on the platform a help button which allow you to do two things. One is uh, raise a question if you're facing some challenges or difficulties in operating the platform, but you also have uh, an opportunity to suggest. And we're really keen on getting the people on board 
to feedback or I'd like to see that functionality and uh, a button to do that here and there. We're not planning to implement every request, but if we see that there's a request that will come four, five, ten times from different parts of the world, it, we're probably going to look at this as something to be considered as the next phase development. Um, and then more and more, uh, we're moving into advocating uh, using this platform for going more and more collective in the way we do prepositioning as part of this larger advocating about moving towards pooling resources and working collaboratively. So that's where we're heading. Uh, we are present on LinkedIn and we have a website, uh, so you can feel free to reach us at that point. The presentation is um, is available on the website, on the home page, uh, so feel free to reach out if you need. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, so there's a few questions there. Okay, uh, a short explanation of that's fine. The, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. There are some questions. The filters overview dashboard. Uh, first question is the data on disaster also so accurate and actual as to the global disaster alert? Okay. Is the data on disaster also so accurate? Uh, Okay, so data on disaster <coughs> is from uh, MDAT, which is um, which falls under the Center of Response and Epidemiology. Uh, miss the first last letter, uh, but it's actually quite a recognized um, institution. There's always question about you know how accurate the data are when we do implement our mathematical model. By definition, a mathematical model is wrong because you just have to make assumptions. So <laughs> I give you one of them. Um, if we are told by this MDAP database that there was 100,000 people affected somewhere, we consider in the model that 100,000 people are in need of uh, assistance, which we know in reality is not the case. But we, we have to have the figures, uh, we have to use the figures we have. So any mathematical model is based on some assumption and we we don't um, get out of that rule. So in terms of the data being accurate, yeah, I think that's they can always be more accurate. We're quite confident with what we have, uh, but to be honest, I have not explored the GDAC system. So it might be a good suggestion for us to uh, dip into that and see if we can, as a complement of information or use them as well, etc. So yeah, absolutely happy to look into that. I'm gonna take some notes in that, but I think those questions will be recorded anyway. And the second question is, the number of user organization is growing. Yes, is it possible to map all organization items in the ESOP database, but only make a certain item area public? Yes, uh, so we have two, we have put two systems in place at the moment to protect uh, for those kind of security uh, situation. The first one is that you have the capacity as an organization to hide your exact location. So I can show you, but it's gonna take a bit of time. But when you create a facility, you create a name and then you put an, an address or you put a GPS location and then it will pinpoint it on the map exactly where you are. In many places, that's fine. Uh, I spent 10 years in the Pacific and that was actually not a security risk, but I understand that in many other places, <coughs> stock represent a value, not only financially, but if you're in a place where people are unfortunately starving uh, and having the capacity to see there's a warehouse full of food somewhere, probably a security risk. So we have, uh, included this functionality when you can hide your exact location and you can select a higher location. So instead of Malag of uh, Madagascar of a pinpoint in Madagascar, you will be able to tick a box saying I hide my location and instead I display it at this level, which might be the province, in which case your pinpoint on the map will be displayed in the middle of the province or the country, in which case the pinpoint will be in the middle of the country. So you can still participate into sharing your information for the collective analysis, but you remove the risk of being displaying exactly where you are. You also have an ability to hide who you are. So if you're any political reason or security tension or whatever, you still want to participate, but who hide who you are, you will be able to enter all your data, hide your detail, and then instead of having a logo of who you are, you will come up as an ego, a logo of ESOPs which is fine because we as an, as an initiative, we don't have stock of our own. 
So that could be also a capacity to hide that. So the last feature we have started to be requested and we look into is for people who say, I'm happy to map all the stocks I have, but I only have a part of that stock that is uh, set for disaster response. The rest is already engaged on two programs. How do I separate them? So it's something we are considering. It's not ready yet. And we need to have a lot of discussion, but we're planning to go into that direction. Does this answer your question? Uh, who, I'll okay, cool. Um, okay, I see no other question in the chat. Is there any other live question that uh, people would like to ask or go through or comment? Yes, Jihad. Thank you, Laurent, uh, for the uh, explanation and for the time. Um, I just have a, a, a quick question or clarification now. Uh, since the data is uh, filled or submitted by different users, each yeah. one we will fill whatever stock he has in place. Now we understand that those data might be a little bit different or not accurate. It depends on when, how often they do, as you show in the dashboard uh, that you have. My concern here, or I don't know if you have already figured out any solution for this or how we are treating this, that multiple names of the same item how this <laughs> how this gets uh, <laughs> uh, how this uh, gets shown because i saw an example you gave like you have tarpaulin someone is entering the unit of measurement as pieces some of them as uh, you know each so um yes yeah. it i know it's an issue uh, we we it, it took us time to do it, and still sometimes we are facing the same issue. But uh, what could be a solution from my end that, or maybe it will come later, that if you develop a platform, because I know you mentioned that you have linked there that system warehouse management system to your system, but if you have like a sort of um, a phase or a window where it is a drop down list, so it is, and this will make it easier, and somehow it will make the 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 data more um, uh, in one uh, language, let's put it this way. So when we say blanket, it's a blanket because as you know, there's two types of blankets. So, yeah. you know, there's some for winter, some for summer, which is the uh, the, the synthetic and the uh, wolf uh, blanket. Um, so I don't know um, if, if I do have a user manual uh, so they yeah. can at least as they can when they are entering the data. I know it's very difficult to also tell them what to do. Yeah. Uh, you always try to adopt what they have. Yeah. It's not easy. So thanks, it's a very good question. I actually, uh, I, I will be able to link that up as well with uh, the initiative we're looking together with Impact. Yes, we face that problem very early on, like many. Uh, the system we have developed is called an item group. Um, so I'll give you an example if you can see my screen. You can create an item uh, as part of organization, whatever you want. So I can call it tarps, um, plastic, and four by five because it's a, it's a big tarp. And I can call it whatever that way. Before I save it, I have to attach it to an agreed um, cluster. Oh, sorry, that's not the right, so sorry, that's the wrong page, uh, item list. So if I create an item, I can create whatever I want, tarps. I can give it a description if I want detail about the fact that it's, uh, you know, if it's a blanket, you could say it's woolen, it's medium thermal, it's one meter by two, whatever you want. You can put anything in that box. And then you have to, to attach it to an existing item group. In that case, blankets. So all the ones that are recorded under blanket will be aggregated, which is what I show you in the stock report when you saw the number of blankets. You have all type into the of blanket in there. When you go back into your <coughs> stock mapping and you see the detail of blanket, you have the item group showing here, blanket. But you can see that I can also decide to add a, a item here and a colon. And here I will have the detail. So the information is not lost. You will see here I have a blanket of two by two meter by one fifth, which is two kilo. And I have a medium thermal blanket, which is a red cross standard. And I have one in fleece. So the information are here but we aggregated it under an item group. 
The item group for the moment have been defined by the technical cluster lead in the Pacific at the time I started with that project. Uh, but we've started to engage with the global technical cluster lead because we believe that those names should not be defined by logistics, but by the programs themselves. So we're trying to give that the only thing in that data, I show you those four first will be managed by super admin, that's true. But the cluster page will try to, the item group page, sorry, will be managed by the technical cluster lead if they decide to come on board so that they can decide if we call a water container, water container globally as the name of the item group or jerry can. That's simply a nomenclature question. But that's the way we've been doing to aggregate the data, is to aggregate that under a blanket. The assumption behind it is that when you operate at a national level, the first important information you need is not if the blanket is woolen or fleece, is how many you are, are you have and where they were. Now, if you need to drill down then at the provincial level, you do have the information, but the most critical information is do I have enough and where they are. So that's why we aggregate this under item group. And where I wanted to point as well, I think this is also where there's a link between the UMATEN data bank using the HS code uh, to map the stock and the work that doing impact on trying to create those relief item HS code is that we would love that our item groups and your item group in the data bank and the HS from impact are all connected as one so that we all talk the same language, which is also one of the outcomes that came out of the last UNHRD reports uh, from the annual global meeting, which one of the things they, they came out with was we don't talk the same language. And I think uh, all the steps that you guys have taken, that the impact are taken and that we are taken here, it's not about standardizing the technical specification, but at least starting by the start, at the beginning of standardizing the way we call a cat. Does this answer your question, Gerard? Yes, yes, thank you very much, my dear. Totally understood. Is there any other question or comments? Uh, I saw that uh, Sophia has put a few links on the chat about the website, the YouTube channel, etc. Keep in mind the YouTube channel is very empty at the moment, but it will start being populated with the how-to guide, uh, also referring to what you were mentioning, Jad. We have on the platform a list of those item group and what should fall under, so there is a kind of a guidance there. Uh, so feel free to reach out and to reach out to us if you have any follow-up question, we are always available. And thanks again for the log cluster for the opportunity. Thank you, Florian. Thank you very much. If there's no more question. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, looking forward to see you on the platform. <laughs>